<laughs> it's good to be out. Yes, yes. And uh, welcoming also our online collaborators, two of them. Uh, the people from the other university were not able to join us remotely, but they are with us in our hearts and in our words. And we look forward to presenting about online study abroad, fostering intercultural awareness in the COVID-19 era. And we have, oh, I can't look at my friend. All right, <laughs> there we go. We have six people in this presentation. So myself and Dr. Edison Passos from Yenzak International College. Then here on our screen, we also have Nicholas Morales and Christina Gregory from Cal State University San Marcos. And then again, unable to join us right now in real time, but with us all the way are Flannery Norton and Miriam Hutchins from Sonoma State University. So uh, Anderson, I think you're okay, yes. going to so, say something about this. Uh, yes. Just a little introduction about our school. Yes, there we go. Okay, so this is pretty much the administrative stuff. Uh, we are very small. Uh, four-year college in Kyushu, in Miyazaki. We brag about uh, teaching most of our classes in English to Japanese students and international students. We have a very unique curriculum and uh, we are very proud of that. So in that unique curriculum, it happens to it happens that we have a study abroad component and differently from other institutions in Japan, where students can either choose to go or not, or are sent to abroad institutions for a very short period of time, we actually send our, all our students in their second year, second semester, for the whole semester abroad. And uh, of course, there are some exceptions. We have some kids who cannot fly or have other uh, uh, special situations. Uh, and we do run an mm -hmm. on-campus uh, study abroad for those kids and uh, but it, we try to do as much as we can but of course it doesn't replace the experience of being abroad. The main uh, part, the main thing that we uh, are really proud to brag about when we talk about our study abroad program is that uh, our students they don't go to uh, English speaking countries and just stay there uh, going to classes and coming back to the dormitory they actually have this cultural experience. They go to America or New Zealand, Australia, and they stay with host families. And from the beginning, from the uh, beginning of our institution in 94, the belief was that uh, to learn a language, you also need to learn, learn the culture of the people who speak that language. That will help our students to understand the whole context. And therefore, this is very important for us. What happened, though, as you are uh, very well aware, is that the last two years, because of COVID, uh, all institutions in Japan, I believe, did not send students abroad. And that actually capped our program. One of the strongest pillars in our educational program was suddenly not there. We weren't able to send any students to the abroad institutions. Uh, what did we do? That's when it came our partnership with the institutions who were already working with us, but uh, through special arrangements, they were able to set up those online courses to provide the cultural components that was missing in the program. So what we, uh, what we did in 2020, and I was one of the facilitators for this, is we had students coming to campus. We were very slow about actually having people learn from home for various administrative reasons. And so we had a class, two classes of 20 students each, uh, Zooming from a single classroom with their masks on home. So if you can imagine that. And then in 2021, I think there was greater awareness of the real medical issues with that. And so we shifted to an online situation so the students were Zooming either from their homes or if they didn't have a proper technological setup, computer, internet problems, what have you, they could come to our school, MIC, and they could use a, some classrooms that were designated for those students. And so in our study abroad, in our entire study abroad program, we have exchanges with the USA, and here are the two universities here, Sonoma State University and Cal State University San Marcos with our little California puppies. Also, we have programs in the UK and Australia, but we didn't, uh, he and I were both working in the US universities. They had different facilitators, different professors working with each of those groups. 
and it was too unwieldy to make a huge collaboration with all of the professors and, and it just logistics made it very simple for us to come and do this presentation but i would like to believe that the similar i know we have similar successes in the other programs and some similar issues of challenge as well and so just for background here we are it's like international college a little cherry blossom in southern Kyushu, uh, right along the beach here. So we are uh, in Kiyotake, actually proper, but um, really on the quite other side of the Pacific from our, our neighbors and interlocutors. So by doing this, as uh, Anderson mentioned, this entailed uh, some big changes, including the issue of losing the study abroad program uh, component of having a homestay. Um, it also had a little bit of effect on the way that our study abroad program is structured, because another thing we do is we have the students all do a portfolio, which I think the last time we were here, we talked about e-portfolio. We did mobilize the e-portfolio to capture the study abroad portfolio experience um, as well, which had three components. And I think you're going to talk about yes, this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to give a little background on how our study abroad works, uh, since we are sending students for a whole semester abroad, uh, we have to give them graduation credits for that. Uh, the way it works is pretty much six, six, two. That's how the credits are divided. Uh, English classes are taken in the study abroad institution and it's basically English language instruction. So for these classes in the on campus study abroad, we were able to mimic perfectly what the other institutions were doing. We could, we had the staff on campus that could uh, cover those classes. For the independent study, independent study is basically uh, students choose a topic from the place where they are going to study abroad and they try to write a research-like paper uh, about that topic. So they get uh, support from an on, on campus, on campus, or an abroad instructor who, if they are in California, someone from California will help them to be their advisor for that project. Uh, once again, on campus study abroad, then I was able to get two different teachers to, in both years to uh, manage this class. Students come in, uh, explain their topic. It's basically an academic writing, advanced academic writing class, but uh, it focuses more on research and how to write a proper research. Then what we are focusing here today is the Aristotle component. As Deborah mentioned before, of course, we cannot do the host family experience. I don't want to bring uh, 80 students into my house to interact with my family. <laughs> but uh, having our partner institutions uh, bringing cultural topics uh, and explaining those topics. And these guys, and you will see later when they start speaking about it, these guys, they have worked with us for several years. They know our students. They know what our students can do and cannot do. So it was very easy to work with all the institutions abroad, not only in the US, but also in other countries. And what comes next is uh, an example of California, I think. Yes, yes, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened sort of on the ground with that, some of the plus and minus of the situation as it turned out. And then some of the issues that come up when you work with these sorts of things. I know with Corona, with Corona, we have all really expanded our repertoires. It's been like a huge crash professional development course for all of us uh, and also a lot of student development as well. So I'll talk about that for a minute. And then I'll talk about uh, the Northern California Institution, Sonoma State, and show you some of these topics that he's mentioning that come into uh, the area study Zoom courses and can often be Grist for the mill, that the, the topics emerge from that for the independent study. Okay, so yes, some of the benefits and challenges. First, I'll just pop this in. These are just some uh, very uh, low level results we should mention. We do always do student evaluations. And so, from the quantitative perspective, uh, just uh, two things came up. The, the hardest thing for the students, I have the little squinty uh, suffering student over there on the left. <laughs> the hardest thing for the students was preparation and review. And, I think that was easy to say about anybody teaching with students in various physical locations. You didn't have that sense, sense of cohortship. So if people kind of fell off the track, didn't do their homework, maybe somebody in their family was ill, you know, life really, really shifted for a lot of people and it was hard for them. It was harder for them to stay in student mode when they were out of the usual physical, you know, the physicality of the habitus of coming to school 
meeting your buddies, maybe going into the student study area and working on your stuff, having homework time with your friends. And so preparation and review is a real challenge for the students and they themselves recognize this. Of course we recognize this because we know, uh, but it was clear from their perspective as well. On the high points of it, they uh, spoke very, very highly of our uh, abroad institutions with the instructor enthusiasms, the teaching methodology methodologies, and they will talk about that a bit. And also the, uh, as uh, Anderson mentioned, the difficulty level was really delivered at a way, at a, at a, at a pace that they could, they could do, they could do. So students that really uh, were able to dig deep and keep their attention and their focus going and be prepared and review really made some significant progress during this. One thing that through all of it. And you could see it, it when we would meet with them, we would see it before, before our eyes and we could tell on the Zoom sessions that we were also participating in. Yeah. One thing that must be mentioned here is that uh, we do course evaluations every end of semester. And but this time we weren't able to get permission to share the actual comments yeah. with you guys. Yeah. There was no time enough to get that, that uh, approval. So because me and Deborah, we were teaching two groups of uh, US, uh, for the US group. So we were able to compile our evaluations and come up with uh, what was the, what were the problems, what were the good points of it. So this is not this is specific the to US? Yes. This oh, is sorry, specific. sorry. I, sh I should have said Anderson compiled this data because he <laughs> did. And thank you, that's news to me, but it's also a big boon to our-, our yeah, Since we are presenting, there's no problem for us to share yeah. the good and bad mm -hmm. points, but uh, okay. I didn't feel comfortable sharing other interpreters. I thought you meant like we can't share the numbers, we can't really talk about it in detail. I didn't realize that you had sub, uh, some categorized the US data, but that's even a stronger uh, result for our talk. Okay, so um, as he is, obviously you can see he's, He's the dean, he's in charge of all this stuff. He does the backdoor management area. I am a mere peon instructor, uh, but I should comment from my point of view the kinds of things that came out of this as a term, as specifically as personal development. So it was really an interesting experience doing this because when I was a graduate student at UC Davis, I worked in a similar program. I taught students from Jose University. I taught, I, I voluntarily taught the lowest level students. And we're talking like, teach them the hokey pokey and do like TPR, <laughs> right hand in, right hand out kind of activities to get their English skills up while they were doing homestay. Okay, so I have seen sort of the flip side of this, you know, 20 odd years ago. But, um, you know, having this experience and also I had been a study abroad student, so I can kind of relate to it from that perspective and how much of a challenge it is to interact with new people. Um, but so, and it's always been, the study abroad has always been this maturational rite of passage for our students. And I've written about it in those terms that they go away and then other students say, you know, grow up and come back. It's like, okay, you're not the keeping aside, is it? You know, really. Because it is really a different experience to go from learning English in classrooms to going to another country. Those of you who are not from Japan who are here studying can relate to that in this case. And uh, certainly we can all see that, that it, is a, it is a time in their lives when they would be expected to be much more socially mature as well when they come back and go into third year um, studies and job hunting and all that. So of course I really learned that the online courses that were being offered offered some really rich opportunities for the students to learn about those places and what they did and they'll tell you more about that themselves. And uh, also working with the portfolio time in the first year I was one of the portfolio coaches and I can really see the challenges involved in their writing both the essay form of the area of studies writing which is very personal and the independent studies, which is more research oriented and more sort of objective in writing and see what challenges are there. And then the, I don't know if we can call it washback, but it's kind of that feeling like, because I saw how much they struggled, I have modified both my second year first semester class and my third year classes because the next hurdle after study abroad in academic writing terms is the senior thesis. They have to do another independent study project, much larger in scope and much more strict in format and so seeing that midpoint where they're really just starting to grapple with this was a real uh, boon for me in thinking of how to develop my teaching to reflect um, their needs as much as possible. So, okay, um, so I want to talk about Sonoma. Yes, but, but on ahead. the administrative side, yeah. uh, Deborah gave her view on the, on the structure, from the instructor's perspective. On the administrative side, the stakes were really high because uh, in the four years that students are with us, they cannot promote the third year. Uh, they cannot take 
third year classes unless they reach a 500 score in the point. So with Corona and not being able to send students abroad, that gave us, uh, a, it, it was a big problem. We could foresee the issues coming. Why am I saying this? Because uh, unfortunately, some students actually have their scores like exponentially uh, going up after the study abroad experience. They are struggling in the first three semesters and then finally they go abroad and when they come back, as Deborah mentioned, they are different beings. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a 100% uh, transformation, 180 degree transformation. So they are different. And that saved many of our students in the past. So why am I saying this? Because in the third year, fall semester, they start their senior thesis. A fourth year, they have to finish that uh, research project. So they have to have domain, basic domain of English language. They have to interact in the classroom. I was in the other uh, section in the morning, first section, and one of the teachers, were, one of the presenters were mentioning that Japanese students do not interact. They do not in talk, uh, talk in class. Uh, you cannot do class-wide uh, work because the students will not work with you. And in our institution, this is not true. That's what we do in the third and fourth year classes. We basically, sometimes I, I sit down in my fourth year class, I sit down and tell them, teach me, you guys do the work. I'm not, I'm not doing anything today. So just an example, don't take it literally. But, uh, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that not having that plan B for all those students who were struggling with language up to the third semester, uh, we could see the problems. Okay, and when they are going, before they go to study abroad, the rhetoric, I always tell them, you should have the 500 before going, but they don't miss. They are having fun, they are uh, bonding with their friends, and they will go abroad, they will not take the toilet there, when they come back, it's a rush. But this time, with everyone on campus, with everyone interacting, with the same teachers that ha they have been interacting for three semesters, it was obvious that their English language was not going to improve. Okay, and we are talking about numbers, TOEIC numbers, because in Japan, TOEIC is very important, right? So we were afraid that losing, that Corona would actually uh, have a very bad effect on our uh, curriculum. What happened, though, is I can tell you honestly that uh, every year we have one or two students who do not reach the 500 choice point threshold. And last year, we had one. So which means that uh, even though uh, students did not go to study abroad, we were able to keep the, the instructional quality as much as we could. And the benefits, not benefits, the, the bad effects of Corona on our study abroad experience and on students understanding cultures and improving their language level was actually not that big. So from the administrative point of view, working together with the abroad institutions and having that program tailored for our students was actually a very, very good thing. It was very successful. Yeah, I agree. And so now I'm going to turn and give you some uh, examples of this. Here is the uh, curriculum that the students had with Sonoma State. And so just to give you a little bit of the logistics, once a week they would Zoom uh, in a course with the Sonoma team, and once a week they would Zoom with the San Marcos team, who are going to tell you more about what they did uh, themselves here in a moment. But yes, you can see here are some of the topics. They start out with sort of getting to know you, things that people would have experienced on the ground things about Northern California, and then getting into social institutions, uh, a look at the university itself, because they do offer a very solid program where students can go in and then transfer into state schools in, uh, and, and transfer to other curricula in, in California. Again, looking at some of these very difficult social issue topics and in very deep and moving ways uh, was really, I think, rewarding and, and important for the students, particularly given the things that are going on in history right now before our faces in the US. Um, and here are some of the comments from one of the instructors, Miriam Hutchins, and she really connected what she was teaching and what they were doing to this idea of the 
independent study and also of the area studies that students could have a greater awareness of global issues and also problem solving. She was, they were always very interested in looking at comparative things and presenting cases in the US and offering ideas about how students could think about the Japanese case. Uh, so what have we got going on with homelessness in Miyazaki? What have we got going on with some of these other issues? We have obviously a lot of foreign trainees in Miyazaki, what's happening with them? So giving ideas for students to connect what they often think of as problems other countries have with things that were right inside our, our, our situation. So, you know, where is the food bank in Miyazaki? We talked about that. So they would have ordinarily gone volunteering if they had physically gone to Sonoma State. And if they had gone there, they wouldn't have gone to, obviously they wouldn't have gone to San Marcos. It would have been one school or the other school. So one of the reasons I think that they really made it through is that they really had both these schools offering them all these things. And you're, you'll hear more and more about what uh, I'm about to stop talking and hand it over to San Marcos. Um, but yes, with these kinds of, they really, their, their motivation was to think about these global issues in a problem solving format and to try to come up with solutions and to get young people realizing that this is what they need to do. So do you have anything you want to add before we turn it over? No. Nope. Okay, let us hand it off right now to um, Cassinia and Nicholas. And here we go. So please, one of you say something so we can know whether or not everyone can hear you. We are ready to have you present now. I'm afraid to look at that. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. You're, you're muted. muted. Fine. <laughs> but you haven't been muted. You haven't been muted. And so, could you hear me? Could you hear me? Okay, so it's your yes, turn now. Yes, Karen Deborah. Could you hear me through the other computer? No, we could not. <laughs> All right, we well, are raising into the heavens. So please, please carry on, and with my great apology. I wasn't muted before when you went in the hallway. Uh, no, I had to mute otherwise that people ah. would be terrible. So. Sorry, I was Sorry. afraid to open the chat book. Okay, please carry on. This is Cassidia Gregory and Nicholas Morales from Cal State University, San Marcos. It's all yours. Can you hear them? Nicholas, I can't hear you. Uh -oh. So just to fill the space, this is the kind of presentation that we had in the Zoom situation. The Away Universities presented slides, and they made these slides. All the slides from here on here, here on out, are slides that they made themselves uh, to give students visual materials to go with the various topics. I still can't hear you. That happened during classes. So. <laughs> Hello, now. Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, great. So, um, as I was saying, I'm Castania. I have split up the slides. Uh, so, I'll start with the first three and then Castania will carry on from there. Um, it's our pleasure to be here, first of all. So, thank you for uh, having us and uh, listening to some of our uh, experiences with this unique program uh, as many of you have experienced uh, the past two years have been a steep learning curve learning to do a lot of things online that we've never done or maybe we get planned to do at some point and never gotten around to so uh, yeah i think we've learned a lot in this and uh, we found some uh, great surprises and uh, and found out how, uh, how much we could do with it um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so this program, uh, from our end, we uh, brought uh, not just uh, myself as an uh, instructor, but we have uh, some service learning students uh, who uh, also participate in various uh, different programs. And in this one, uh, we were able to bring them in to every lesson as kind of conversation partners. So we call them our student facilitators. And uh, there are some cons and pros to this. Um, I would start with the pros. I'll start, start with the, my favorite things about the first. Uh, the students had a lot of uh, English, native English speaking or uh, English fluent uh, partners. 
Uh, many were from the United States, there are some from other countries as well. And uh, so that provided them more conversation partners to practice their English with. Um, one of the uh, cons of this was that from uh, the planning perspective, it adds another layer uh, onto uh, the logistics of making the program work. Um, just as an example, the, uh, the students had their orientation uh, before the program started, and then the uh, service learning students from in the US side uh, had to have their own orientation too and kind of learn how what the expectations were. So we had to make those expectations very clear and uh, sometimes follow up with them. Um, and uh, little small things like tracking the hours, which wasn't too hard to do, um, but just that, that added an extra layer. So that was something to consider, but I think it was very rewarding uh, from what I could see. Uh, one way we utilized these uh, student facilitators and kind of got a little bit more interaction than just having them instead of listening to me talk uh, was breakout rooms. So we uh, put them into small groups, into rooms and give them something to talk about. And uh, then we come back and have each group share out. So the uh, two English speakers on the US side would often start off speaking, but then uh, we have them, you know, nominate someone from their group to share something they discussed about. So gradually we got more participation uh, and speaking from the students on the Japanese side after that. Uh, in, uh, as far as the last part here, instructor collaboration. Uh, so this was another kind of layer. There had to be a lot of communication back and forth between uh, me and, and the other uh, instructors on the Japan side. Uh, I know Deborah and I talked a lot, and Anderson and I talked a lot in our last uh, rounds, uh, second year of doing this. Um, it was really necessary to kind of collaborate to get on the same page, this is really kind of a unique program where this is uh, inside, right, embedded in a larger uh, class and curriculum in Japan. So, uh, yeah. So this, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I can hear myself. Um, I thought someone else was speaking. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, as I was saying, uh, this back and forth, getting on the same page, um, was really important to, to really be able to serve the students and know what their needs were, know what they knew and didn't know. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more on one of the next slides. But I had a lot of insight in talking with uh, uh, Deborah and Anderson to, to understand what the uh, What's going on with the students, and maybe not uh, have, not make too many assumptions about what they might already know or understand from what I'm talking about. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, all right, so this is part two of the logistics, um, and uh, so uh, we had our participants in the first year. Uh, from the TESOL TEFL certificate program. So we have an English uh, as a second language uh, program teaching uh, prospective teachers uh, pedagogy and how to uh, teach English as a second language. And so that was a great opportunity to have them come into the class, contribute something and practice their teaching as well. So again, it was kind of the same issue which is that uh, adds another layer, adds another uh, kind of uh, instruction. So it's not just one person, myself, talking. Um, but of course, again, that took extra logistics as well. So some mentoring, some debriefing after lessons, planning before the lessons. Uh, but at the end of every lesson, uh, we would have one of those uh trainees or graduates um, teach um, a mini activity related to the weekly topic. And so this added a lot of variety into the lesson and again kept it from just being a passive 
uh, listening on their part of us. Um, now, another thing to consider was schedule considerations. So, holidays come up, school holidays, uh, be like savings time, time some differences. So, all of these are potential stumbling blocks when planning out and uh, enacting the curriculum. And so, uh, this is just one thing we've learned uh, after, you know, we did fine. And, and for the first year, we had some surprises and we worked together again, talked and collaborated to, to make everything run smoothly. But we learned from that. And then the second year went much smoother, um, knowing more ahead of time kind of what the uh, schedule considerations would be. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, and finally, is the technology. So uh, there were several platforms that we used while we were uh, doing this program. Zoom, which we're on right now, uh, we used uh, uh, Moodle, which uh, I believe MIC uses as well. Uh, this is kind of an online learning uh, platform where you put the class classroom. And so those two pieces, uh, again, uh, when you include technology, you have a bit of a learning curve. So uh, for the first week or two, we might have had some connectivity issues and things that got kind of smoother and resolved more uh, as things went on. For the Zoom in particular, uh, in my lessons, I would always uh, give maybe plan as much as 10 minutes just for people to all get in and all be situated. Another reason why I started off with these kind of conversations at the beginning before I jumped into a lecture that gave me a bit of a buffer in case there was any issues with people dropping, uh, dropping out for the next gen or anything else. So it was good to have that at the beginning. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about one more piece. Um, so that is the Facebook. We used Facebook. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide, but actually, uh, you may or may not know, Facebook isn't the most uh, popular uh, uh, social media platform for younger people. So many of our students didn't even have a Facebook page. And there was a little bit of skepticism on their part, a little bit of pushback when we said we we're going to have Facebook incorporated. Uh, even myself, I wasn't sure how it worked. Uh, but we'll talk about that on the next slide. So uh, let's continue. All right. So this is kind of, I'll start on the right side actually here. Um, and we have 15 weekly topics. So each week we have a different topic. Uh, there were two different student groups. So uh, group one would be on Monday here, and uh, group two would be on Wednesday here. In Japan, it was Tuesday, Thursday, I believe. Um, and uh, each group would look at their topics. So, week one, Monday, getting to know you. Wednesday, getting to know you, group two, and so on. So, we talked about a lot of different topics. Um, US politics was a really deep one that we did our best to kind of disentangle. Uh, holidays were really popular, Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and learning about some of the differences of how we celebrate it here and in Japan, Korea, Nepal, some of the different places that our students came from. Uh, food was also one that a lot of people seemed to connect with. Uh, we had American food and cuisine. Uh, many people didn't realize just how diverse uh, it is in our big country here, and we've learned a lot about foods uh, in other countries as well. And we always left those sessions very hungry, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, some other things like uh, small talk uh, and uh, practicalities, uh, communication in the U.S. One of the ones that really surprised me was uh, sports. How uh, excited and how many stories people had to tell uh, about sports and ways they had participated. 
in sports uh, throughout their lives. So this is kind of uh, how the uh, lessons were organized. First, before each session, um, there was preparation. So me, myself, and the teachers would discuss it a bit. Uh, I'd send out some uh, warm-up questions, some kind of like uh, guiding questions for the instructors to discuss with the students. Um, the students would post in the Facebook group, answering some questions a week in advance. Uh, just as an example, maybe introduce yourself or get to know you. Uh, maybe for number four, uh, what did you what did you do on Halloween? What is a Halloween symbol you know? Just kind of questions to kind of get people started on that topic. Uh, and you would post that into the Facebook in class, and we have uh, discussions at the beginning. I'd give a lecture, and then at the end, there would be those mini activities, which were kind of little discussions. So, a discussion, uh, lecture, discussion format. Then, afterwards, uh, students uh, would then go back in their Japanese classroom and on their own reflect on what they learned, have some uh, support from their teachers to explain. I'm sure many questions came up uh, that were interesting. Maybe you'll be able to speak to that later. Uh, and uh, additional resources were also provided for any students that were curious and wanted to know more. Uh, let's continue to the last slide on my part. Uh, oh, sorry. Back one, my mistake. I'll, I'll say one more thing before I pass it on. Um, so uh, about the Facebook part, how did it go? I thought it was fantastic. I saw so much uh, interaction outside of the classroom thanks to this asynchronous portion of the class. So before every week, people would post, but they were also required to to reply to at least three classmates' posts. And this was important because that meant they had to interact. And in doing that, people started conversations. And uh, just uh, uh, being able to see pictures of people's pets, people's favorite foods, pictures of them at Christmas time, or with family, or with their sports team, uh, those all started conversations that might not have happened. They created a more personal connection, a more community feel, I think, uh, to the class. And uh, I was just blown away uh, seeing all of this uh, content and participation from both the American side and Japanese side uh, students. The MIC students and the ones at CSUSN. So I'll, I'll go on, uh, turn it to Ksenia now. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Deborah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can you hear have me well? Yes, and I should mention we have about 10 more minutes, so it's all yours. Oh, perfect. Um, yes, I know in the previous parts of the presentation, the focus was more on how students benefit, benefited from this collaboration. And uh, now I'm going to switch focus a little bit more to the administrative parts of this program. And a big part, because I'm the Associate Director of American Language and Culture Institute, and I was more involved in the setup of the program developments, making sure all parts work uh, like in tune. And um, so one big benefit of this collaboration was definitely developing a partnership between American Language and Culture Institute, CSUSM, and Miyazaki International College. Because previously, in previous years, when we, uh, because our collaboration and partnership, um, it started definitely before I came on board at CSUSM. But before COVID, it was somewhat impersonal, I would say, because what, was what is typical for um, exchange or study abroad programs? A proposal will be submitted, reviewed, questions asked, a few problems, troubleshooted, and uh, students come here, we work with them, and then it's time to go back home. So, but now I feel like um, through this collaboration,
generation in those two years we started to wear face to the name of the Azaki International College uh, because not just administrators collaborated, but instructors were heavily involved in the development and involvement of the program. Um, so it was a lot of more direct interaction between faculty. And now I have a better understanding how um, what we do here when students arrive or what we did online, how it fits into the curriculum of uh, Miyazaki International College, uh, what goal we are helping students work towards you uh, by providing certain experiencing experiences for them and uh, guiding them through the portfolio writing process. Um, another important um, objective that we accomplished, and I think it was a win-win situation, we really met each other's um, in 2020, um, Miyazaki International College was looking for a trusted partner, and we are so uh, honored that they have thought of us. Um, they were looking for a provider who can uh, deliver quality content for a virtual program. And that was a known ter territory for all of us, right? Um, so we are very honored that we were able to deliver. And um, on our hands, um, we certainly benefited within two aspects. Uh, enrollment is a big, glaring word here. And I was just looking, reviewing the report released by Open Doors. It was an, um, released on June 1st, 2022 at NASA conference. And according to Open Doors reports, um, enrollment in the United States in intensive English programs went down by 63%. This is a very, very dramatic drop. Not surprising to anyone, I don't think so, but LCI, CSUS, them certainly experienced a huge drop as well. So, uh, but instead of being all desperate and crying about students not coming here, so we were, uh, we jumped on the opportunity to help out Miyazaki like International College and to help our enrollments as well. So, um, I will talk about numbers later, but another important component, another important objective that we accomplished was uh, virtual program development. Uh, before COVID-19 era, uh, we were talking about how it would be nice to develop virtual programming and add online programs to our portfolio, but it really never happens because, you know, those day-to-day -day priorities uh, take over and we never got to do anything significant. So anyway, COVID blessing in disguise pushed us to do it. And uh, because of the true partnership with MIC, we were able to do it. And um, so MIC will have the badge of our trailblazing virtual online programming partners. So <laughs> yay to MIC. And following that original collaboration, which we did two years in a row, we delivered five other programs. Um, shorter and longer, more intense, more academic in focus, less academic in focus, but MIC were our trail, trailblazing partners, so so grateful to um, have them. Um, another benefit to CSUSM, I would say, was expanding student interaction um, and footprint of Miyazaki International College students on our campus. Uh, because in years past, pre-COVID, we would receive maybe five, seven uh, MIC students in the fall. And um, by choice, they would engage sometimes in conversation partner program, which is a one-on-one -on -one interaction with American students. Uh, but that was it. So five Japanese students and maybe five American students. In between, when we started in 2020, and uh, so two cohorts later, so the number of MIC students was 83 students compared to potentially 10 to 14 students. So that's what eight times more than we would normally uh, serve uh, in those two years. And on our end, it was 29 service learning students and Kessel Temple uh, graduates. Uh, so certainly much bigger interaction, uh, more people involved, and um, so certainly MIC has a bigger footprint now. And so we can move on to the next slide now. So another benefit for CSUSM, um, as Nicholas mentioned, we had two groups of students supporting American students supporting the program. Um, one group was service funding students, and just to give you an idea of what this project is, 
Uh, students in classes, um, the goal of service learning is to connect theory that they're in class with um, the hands-on community project. And um, by collaborating with a community partner, which American Language and Culture Institute is for uh, CSUSM, uh, students were able to engage in an authentic project where they um, help the community, um, our campus community and wider community to um, globalize campus, increase cross-cultural communication skills, and just raise global awareness. Um, so that was certainly a benefit for us and for the students. And for us, as um, a community partner, we were looking for opportunities to increase our service um, and address the needs of our community, of our students, um, to serve internationally and um, in the virtual capacity as well. Because again, students were taking classes online, there were no opportunities to interact with international students. So it certainly helped them engage and help us to deliver the service and increase our reach. Uh, so that was a uh, certain benefit. So those students, um, per their class requirement and service learning, had to put in 15 to 20 hours, depending on their class of facilitation time. And between those two cohorts, two years that we collaborated, we served 26 um, CSUSM students who participated in this project and earned credit, academic credit for participating in this program. Um, another distinct group of students supporting this collaboration was Tesla Temple students. And as Nicholas mentioned, they would um, design activities and deliver them. So that was kind of additional instructor touch, right? Eight in the class. Um, so, and a lot of those students, um, they, um, they're very definitely want to teach, go and teach in Japan. So that was an awesome opportunity to learn, uh, to kind of meet the students, kind of gauge uh, their learning style, learn about the culture of Japan, kind of learn about the educational system in Japan. So they would definitely learn much more from, uh, from this interaction than they would learn otherwise by even teaching students in person in the classroom. So it was a lot of interaction, very helpful for, for their future careers. Um, and uh, so through this program, we helped three uh, Tesla Temple students get their practical experience, add it to their resume, and hopefully get jobs in Japan as they wished uh, prior to joining. Um, another huge and very obvious benefit, I think, uh, is cultural exchange. And um, CSUS, um, I know Miyazaki International College, um, study abroad is a required component. It is not at CSUSM. And uh, only 2% of CSUSM students engage in study abroad experience at all for the short term programs or semester long programs. So it's a very, very small number compared to Miyazaki International College and other universities. So by creating this opportunity and collaboration, we brought study abroad to our students. That was probably their only opportunity to interact with Japanese students uh, for in-depth on a variety of topics and have those personal relationships with them through conversations. And what was cool, um, Miyazaki International College, uh, their students are not only from Japan, but they also have students from South Korea, from China, from Hong Kong, from Nepal. So in addition to that, I think students also had this multi-cross-cultural communication where they learned um, not just Japanese, about Japanese food and culture and politics, but they also learned the Nepalese perspective on that and certainly got many more cultures involved in that cultural exchange. So that was nice to see. And it was very eye-opening to a lot of CSUSM students. Um, on my last slide, I included a few testimonials from CSUSM students. Um, it was um, very touching to read testimonials from the students because sometimes they act shy and they don't maybe uh, show their true feelings. But in their testimonials and in their weekly reports, their reflections, uh, it showed how much they learned and benefited from this experience. Um, Victor, um, he was probably one of the most outspoken students in this cohort. Um, felt like he learned some practical skills 
um, in um, how to manage conversations, how to uh, engage somebody in a conversation, how to make people talk and encourage shy students. And a lot of those students work from positive psychology class uh, and they're, they're future educators as well. So that was a very valuable experience to them. Um, another testimonial has to do with learning about Japan as a country. Um, again, being 15 hours away from us. Um, so students might never have a chance to visit Japan, but they learn a lot through Facebook group through just learning um, through, through the lectures and those in-person conversations uh, in small groups. Uh, like Trinity said, I learned about landmarks because I didn't know anything about Japan before. Um, so, the topics were like from food, right, and uh, pop culture, exchange on uh, current news, uh, but there were some more serious topics as well in politics. And I think what students, their main takeaway was, yes, they're different, but a lot of things are very similar. Like, there are a lot of similarity about politics and how people feel about politics and how they talk about politics between the United States and Japan. So, um, it was a very great experience for our students. And um, I think, in a way, um, they had deeper relationships. Uh, they formed deeper relationships. They, through the screen then they would have formed otherwise in person because they had more purposeful interaction time. Um, so that was great and uh, I'm so glad we collaborated with MIC and uh, so it's a new level of partnership for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Nicholas, and thank everyone who has uh, witnessed this with us and uh, uh, been here today to hear about it. So I just want to uh, list all the people involved, myself, Anderson, Nicholas, and Christina, who you just heard from, also Flattery Norton and Mary Christian from Sonoma State. And because I made this slide, because I made most, uh, all the slides, the, the San Marcos slides, I went ahead and put my email address on there as a contact person. But if anybody wants to get in touch with Cassinia, Nicholas, or any of the other people, I will be happy to, if that's all right with you, I will be happy to pass on your details as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so are you doing this one? Oh, yeah. Okay.